Okay. So, good morning. Officially, we are there. You, some of you have inquired about the impending email with the new procedure, and uh, hopefully I can send it to you this afternoon or tomorrow morning. I will encourage you to already uh, create a log for the, for the school so you don't have it at the last minute. And um, so, and also you need to uh, register for the class a little bit early. So not at the last minute because they have to send you the link. So this is really important and I will repeat it uh, when I send the email. As far as an update, I was hoping to put a, an image on the screen and then I forgot at the last minute that. I must say I had some problems with my computer and it took me a lot of time. Um, we have an update on Notre Dame. They have started again to work on Notre Dame uh, in Paris and the next big thing will be to dismantle the scaffolding that they had set prior to the fire around the arrow because uh, they were actually consolidating the arrow um, in process of doing so and fortunately removed all the statue before the fire uh, but that um, that scaffolding melted and is in terrible condition the big problem is how to remove it and you know the game where you have to remove one thing after the other without the whole thing crumbling down that's exactly what's happening there. So they have made a model of it and know that they have to remove one piece at a time. Otherwise, everything is going to fall apart. So um, this is quite interesting and uh, I will try to, to keep you aware of what's happening. So to come back to Mary Magdalene, she's a figure that really interests me, uh, interest me uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, Anne, you have anything to ask? Anne Mason, raise the hand. Okay, so I don't know. Uh, uh, wait, I'm, <laughs> I have MME Arizona on my screen now. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to get back to you. Don't you see us? No. Oh. So <laughs> You, but you are on something else. So get out of it and come back. I don't know what's happening. Okay. There's some problem with Zoom. I myself was suffered. <laughs> uh, but it shouldn't be. No, you, normally you, you know, what is interesting, you are on the screen. So I don't know how you can't see it. Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll just get out and come back. <laughs> Thank okay. you. So uh, Mary Madeline. Uh, it's interesting because her name has been used for so many things, literally from uh, defining an upper Paleolithic culture in Europe, the Magdalenian culture, uh, to the very delightful light cake celebrate, celebrated by Proust in La Rochelle du Temps Perdu. And if you try these little, uh, these little cakes, they're absolutely uh, wonderful. So uh, he is um, the patron saint of the contemplative life uh, of the converts, of glove makers, and I don't know why, hairstylists you can kind of understand, penitent sinners, perfumery and perfumers, pharmacists, and women as a whole. Now, of course, the reason why uh, we talk about uh, penitence and perfume it's because she's seen very often uh, wiping Jesus' feet with her, with her hair. Uh, so that also gives her a link to hairdresser. She is actually one of the most represented figures of the Bible after Jesus and Mary. Uh, and what we will see here is uh, a few of the monuments or the pieces that represent her. Sometimes we have a, a whole chapel that is decorated in her name. This is in the Lower Church in San Francisco. 
San Francesco in Assisi, uh, the Magdalene Chapel shows different uh, images of the, her life uh, by uh, Giotto. But most of the time, these are uh, paintings or sculptures. This is a really old one going back to 1280, in the 1280s by the master of Magdalene. It's a, what we call a dorsal. So this, that painting would stand on the back of an altar uh, and shows Mary Magdalene, a very early Mary Magdalene, just dressed with her hair, her own hair, and surrounded by different scenes of her life. Uh, this one is in the uh, Galerie dell'Accademia in Florence. This is very Byzantine in style and typical of that period. And we have of about the same uh, period. We have many of these docents to the life of um, St. Francis. We'll see that she's um, worshipped all over the old world. Um, he is a Magdalene altar, pretty uh, known in Tiefenbronn in Germany, showing different scenes of her life. You can see up above again, Mary Magdalene wiping off Jesus' feet with her hair and other scenes of uh, her uh, coming to the coast and here uh, asking for penance. Well, some wonderful piece. This is a, a carved altar piece by uh, Riemenschneider. It is in uh, Münnerstadt. The whole uh, altar piece that you see there is dedicated to Mary, though it is surmounted by a, a pieta. This, by the way, uh, has been completely dismantled. And uh, the only original pieces in the church are the Throne of Mercy, which is that piece down below, John the Baptist, uh, John the Evangelist, and Killian here down at the bottom. Uh, and then the picture tables on the right, these two uh, scenes of Mary's uh, life. Everything else, uh, the central figure of Mary Magdalene is in the museum in Nuremberg. And these two other pieces, um, uh, one in uh, Berlin and the other one um, is in Munich. In Spain, we see many uh, retablos. I just picked these two, uh, but that shows you uh, Mary surrounded by uh, the figures of all kinds of saints or sometimes uh, scenes of her life. And sometimes it's a smaller painting, like this one by Franz Franken, uh, the younger, where you see the scene of Mary wiping Jesus' feet, but surrounded by beautiful scenes in grisaille uh, painted and showing different moments of Mary's life when she's holding the cross down here, when the, the boat arrives in France, when Jesus appears to her as a gardener, as a penitent in a cave, etc., etc. And this is a really small, um, small painting. So in fact, when we know that, that Mary Magdalene is represented so many times uh, in art, but in fact, she's very barely mentioned uh, in the gospels. And the way I build up this uh, slide, this slideshow is showing you first uh, what are the moments where she's mentioned in the Bible. So she's mentioned uh, during the crucifixion by Mark and by John. So you can see uh, the text, some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph and Salome, also often called Mary Salome, by the way. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem were also there. And so here you see actually one woman clearly who is Mary, some women behind, and then Mary Magdalene who is detached and who's holding and touching the feet of Christ. 
uh, this is not mentioned in the Bible. This is something that uh, was a kind of a hyperbole, if you want, uh, that came later on. In John, we have, but standing by the cross of Jesus, where his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. This is, of course, the moment, a very dramatic moment. And I'm going to show you, I wanted you to, to have a chance to see some wonderful uh, illustration of that moment. This is probably one of my very favorite, the descent of the, from the cross of uh, Roger van der Weyden, where we have in that very shallow space, uh, like a box, like what uh, was called at that time a tableau vivant, where you had real people representing this dramatic moment of the passion. And of course, to the right is Mary Magdalene. And there she is, the only one with a low cut dress, which of course uh, personifies her as a woman of lighter uh, kind of uh, life, if you want. The fact that uh, she's supposed to, to have been a, a woman without real virtue. It's an extraordinary piece. Uh, in the Andrea Matenia crucifixion, we have a representation that is closer to the text where we see all these women holding one another without, uh, except for Mary, any particular uh, identification of who is who. The second uh, mention of uh, Mary Magdalene is in the Lamentation, which is the moment where uh, Jesus is, uh, has been taken down from the cross and is um, brought close to the tomb. So in Mark, we have, so Joseph bought some linen cloths, and this is Joseph of Arimathea, uh, took down the body, wrapped it in the linen, and placed it in a tomb, tomb, sorry, cut out of rock. Then he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid, and so on and so on. So you can see that in Matthew, she's also named among them where Mary Magdalene, and that at the bottom, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. In Luke, he doesn't mention Mary Magdalene, he just mentions women. <coughs> and in John, is the same thing, that actually he mentions no other witness to Joseph's burial of Jesus except for Nicodemus. This scene shows, uh, of course, by Giotto, uh, shows the different the older women around him, Mary in blue, of course, Mary Magdalene at his feet. <clears throat> what is wonderful here is you look at all these angels and they all have different expression of grief. So again, uh, the different illustration of that, uh, of that moment is just wonderful with the Raphael the Entombment, very famous piece, which is going to be an uh, inspiration for many coming from there. And where you see that how women have expressed their emotion more by gesture than by expression in the face. The next moment is the women at the tomb with Mark when, oh, and I'm sorry, I didn't highlight it, but when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Very early when the sun had risen, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb. And this is what is uh, represented by Ferrer Bassa, a Spanish painter. Um, he shows the women at the tomb and the angel showing that the tomb is empty. The next scene is Christ appearing to Mary Magdalene as a gardener. Uh, there we have the four evangelists mention it. So when he had risen early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. 
uh, there is a, say during, I mean, this is the moment where it is mentioned the fact that Mary Magdalene uh, had been exorcised in, in a sense. And so they had driven seven demons, which are going to actually become the seven capital sins uh, for in the church. So again, with Matthew, he mentions her, uh, Luke also, and John. One scene that is very often shown is the Noli Metangere, uh, where mostly it is mentioned by John, uh, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb and she wept. She stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they haven't taken away my Lord and I don't know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she didn't know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And then Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mag Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. This is a very important moment in the, the whole story of Mary Magdalene, is that the fact she is the only witness of Jesus resuscitated. Jesus talks to her and he puts her in charge of announcing the others that uh, he is ascending to, uh, to see his father. This is a huge thing that's going to be really important, shows the importance of Mary Magdalene and that she's not just a, another woman. He actually represented by uh, Cornelis van Ostan is Mary uh, dressed in beautiful clothing. Uh, again, a rather low cut uh, dress showing the breast, but she has the ointment jar next to him. And Jesus is represented with a shovel. So he is, he can be mistaken by the, uh, as a gardener. <clears throat> now in the tomb are the other women looking at the empty coffin or sarcophagus. Here I have to let you know that I changed some sequence of painting so you will find different numbers um, and uh, different sequence for a few slides. With Giotto, the no limitangere, don't touch me, is showing very clearly where Jesus is moving away from Mary Magdalene while the angels are sitting uh, on the tomb. Here's one of the panel of uh, Schneider, the no limitangere, where again you can see Jesus, in that case, doesn't have a shovel, but just a staff and uh, Mary, uh, Mary Magdalene is, is kneeling in front of him. Very typical of these carved altarpiece at the time. Uh, this is actually one of the early pieces by him and Schneider, where normally these uh, pieces were polychrome, which means they were painted with many colors. Um, in the case of Tillman, him and Schneider is the first one who didn't do it and just let the plain wood though people were not satisfied with that. And later on, another uh, sculptor painter, uh, Weitstoss, will be in charge of painting uh, the carved altarpiece, though most of the pigment has disappeared. By Dürer, we have Christ appear to Mary Magdalene, and again, he has the shovel. By Titian, 
very uh, beautiful representation with a, a very rich landscape showing Mary trying to touch Jesus. And with Hans Holbein, the Noli Metantre, again you see this, and then some of the disciples uh, moving away at that time. St. Peter and St. John. So these, and totally unaware of what's happening, they are on their way to, Je to Jerusalem. Correggio, extraordinary use of colors. And a very uh, telling gesture towards the, the sky, so towards the heavens, showing, you know, I haven't ascended yet. In Greek, by the way, the noli me tangere is uh, said memu aptu, which means do not seek to hold me, onto me. And Pontormo, this was actually uh, painted after a cartoon by Michelangelo. But uh, Lavinia Fontana, one of the rare recognized uh, female painters of the Renaissance. Very velvety composition. And finally, Rembrandt, the risen Christ appearing to Mary Magdalene with the shovel still, with the large hat. For Claude Lohan, the scene, as usual, is, is just the narrative is very small because it's completely dependent on the landscape that for him was the most important. So you see the tomb and the angels, you see some people there, and then Mary and Jesus there. And in the background, you have the Jerusalem and the Golgotha on the right with the crosses. Up here, you can see the cross is still standing. So how is it that having so few mention in the Bible uh, has given us a Mary Magdalene that is quite a composite uh, figure? All comes from a homily um, by Pope Gregory I in 591, where uh, he is going to very clearly, and we'll read a part of the homily, describe Mary Magdalene as also a figure conflated with the sinner in the Bible um, and the woman who wipes uh, Jesus' feet, which is of course something that is completely artificial because they're not named. They, they talk about what they did except for Mary, the, the sister of Martha, with whom Mag Mary Magdalene from then on will be uh, confounded. Uh, Pope Gregory I was not the first to do this. It had been done for already over 300 years, but he's the one that was the most popular and uh, from which the, the, that new persona of Marie Magdalene is going to spread. So what he says is that he is, uh, she's also, she's the woman from which the seven devils, so demons, were uh, casted out. And these seven uh, devils are going to become the seven capital sins. Her birthplace uh, is supposed to be Magdalene in Greek from El Meshdel in Arabic. Meshdel, Meshdel, the pair would tell me. Uh, so she is conflated with Luke's sinner or John's Mary of Bethany, uh, Martha's sister, with the adulteress, more seldom, but still we have some examples of the Samaritan at the well. And what happens because of all this, she will become the model for repentance and contemplative life, but also make all women sinners uh, through her, 
that all women are a sinner until they repent and then they become uh, either they enter the convent or do things that have nothing to do anymore with real life. So this is going to have a tremendous influence uh, on actually not only the figure of Mary Magdalene, but on us all and the way women are going to be uh, looked at uh, for centuries, literally for 1400 years. Here is the homily uh, by uh, Pope Gregory. So she whom Luca, Luke sorry, calls the sinful woman whom John calls Mary, we believe to be the Mary from whom seven devils were ejected, according to Mark. What, this, what did these seven devils signify, if not all the vices? It is clear that the woman previously used the unguent to perfume her flesh in forbidden acts, that she therefore displayed more scandalously. She was now offering to God in a more praiseworthy manner. She had coveted with earthly eyes, but not through penitence. These are consumed with tears. She displayed her hair to set off her face, but now her hair dries her tears. She had spoken proud things with her mouth, but in kissing the Lord's feet, she now planted her mouth on the Redeemer's feet. For every delight, therefore, she had had in herself, she now immolated herself. She turned the mass of her crimes to virtues in order to, in order to serve God entirely in penance. So this is really the, the core of the text that is going to mark uh, Mary Magdalene for century. So let's look a little bit at uh, these different uh, images. First, this is a photograph taken around 1900 of the the ruins of Magdala, where she supposedly was born. A very beautiful painting by Paolo Veronese uh, shows a painting that supposedly uh, represents the conversion of Mary Magdalene. Um, normally she has a point of ointment, a pot of ointment, and she doesn't have it uh, with her in here. But supposedly she entered the, the temple where Jesus was teaching, uh, dressed in a, a manner that normally was not accepted in the temple, and tried to listen to that uh, man that she had heard was extraordinary. And so she's coming there to, um, to be converted by Jesus, who recognizes her. The Luke sinner of John's Mary of Bethany is mentioned by Luke, as you see, that when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, etc., etc. Um, now, the other one is John, where he identifies Mary as the, the sister of Martha, but as also, in fact, uh, uh, conflated by Gregory uh, with uh, Mary Magdalene. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. And you see that famous scene that we see repeated so multiple times here by Giovanni da Milano in the feast in the house of Simon the Pharisee and Mary Magdalene um, opening the, the feet of Jesus. By Dirk Boots, uh, same scene. And you can see there um, the patron, so the person who commissioned the painting, who is a monk, a Dominican monk. The same um, altarpiece that I mentioned prior uh, by Raymond Schneider and shows that scene also of uh, Madeline wiping Jesus' feet with her hair. The very large uh, feast at the house of Simon um, that is quite a follow-up on a known painting. <clears throat> 
that had been actually looted by Napoleon. Uh, but this one is not. This one was actually uh, offered to Louis, um, to Louis the Fourteen. Is a, actually probably a politically motivated gift. And where you see in the very center Jesus and Mary Magdalene, this is a kind of a development of the feast uh, of the House of Simon that is at the Louvre. Poussin uh, does. Part of the seven sacraments shows penance, and penance is seen here with Mary Magdalene. Now, this is historically uh, apparently more correct. This would have been the Roman way of uh, gathering around the table when they recline. And in the text of Mark, we do talk about reclining at the table. So they would not have been seated, but reclined. Same way with Pierre Subleras who shows everybody reclined around the table. The next one is the adulteress. This is in John. Uh, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what, what do you say? They were using this, of course, as a trap. And of course, Jesus is going to look at them and say, uh, the first one that hasn't sinned, throw the first stone. And I'm shortening the story here. We see Jesus writing on the ground. Uh, while he's asking, and by the time he comes up, everybody has left because they all realize that they have sinned. And so she forgives, he forgives the, the woman. This is, of course, if you think about it, it's still uh, in usage in Saudi Arabia where uh, women that uh, have committed adultery are stoned to death. Extraordinary um, grisaille by uh, Peter Bruegel. And the adulteress is part of that big sin that, that hovers over uh, Mary Magdalene all the time. He is by Tintoretto's workshop, Christ and the Adulteress. She's shown here. From time to time, uh, we see her also conflated with the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan woman is that woman who was at the well and Jesus ask her for a drink and she says, but I'm a Samaritan woman. And normally the Jews were not associating with Samaritans. And so there comes a whole conversation with uh, Jesus. But this is a, a, a more rare type of example. By Anibale Karachi. Guercino, Angelica Kaufmann, that's a neoclassical representation. So these are show that array of representation and we're not finished because the, the history of Mary Magdalene is so rich, uh, the legend and the, all the invention that uh, surround her are uh, so extraordinary. Some texts that have been discovered uh, starting in the 18th century all the way to the early 20th century uh, shed a very different light on her role in the Bible. And these show her as the companion of the Savior. These texts that I'm uh, talk, uh, talking about are all Gnostic uh, texts. Some pre-Christian and early Christian uh, were discovered. And of course, the Christian ones use Christ and Mary in, in a very different relationship. Um, the fact that Mary was very central to, uh, to the cult and the fact that uh, she was almost like a, a prophet. She was used by Jesus 
as the principal uh, messenger to the others. So these different texts, uh, the Codex Brucianus that was written in the fourth and fifth century was found near Thebes in, at the end of the 18th century. Pistis Sophia that dates back to the third and fourth century sold to the British Museum in 1785. The Gospel of Mary that was written in the second century in Greek and copied in the fourth century uh, was part of what you call, what I call now the Berlin Gnostic Codex, uh, was discovered also in Egypt and contained some Coptic translation of three very important Christian Gnostic, uh, Gnostic texts. The Gospel of Mary, the Apocryphon of John, Sophia of Jesus Christ. And then the very important Nag Hammadi collection that shows 52 mostly Gnostic treatises that date back to the third and fourth century. And you can see here these codices. Uh, these were found in the jar, by the way, in um, Egypt, in the, the town of Nag Hammadi. Uh, the people that found it were concerned by, to open the jar, thinking maybe a genie would come out of it, and uh, finally opened it, uh, brought it home, and unfortunately, a good part of them were burned by their wives. Um, finally, they were uh, discovered whatever was left, and it's an extremely important uh, information that relates to the Gnostic uh, religion and philosophy, which has being put down by the, the Christian church early on. Uh, they were so afraid of these um, different beliefs, which um, really threatened them. And so uh, they tried to everything that they could Uh, to to erase what it was. There was a, a terrible oppression and uh, literally a crusade against uh, the people in South of France that had some Gnostic beliefs. Uh, I encourage you uh, to look into it if you're interested. It's, it's a very different um, way of looking at life. They, they see uh, the, the sin being in, in the flesh that you have to become very eroded, that knowledge, and that's where the gnosis, the gnostic comes from. It's the fact that knowledge will help you reach uh, the ultimate level. So part of the Gospel of Mary of Magdala from part of this gives you an idea of what, how they consider Mary. Then Mary stood up, she greeted them all, addressing her brothers and sisters. Do not weep and be distressed, nor let your hearts be irresolute. For his grace will be with you all and will shelter you. Rather, we should praise his greatness, for he has prepared us and made us true human beings. When Mary had said these things, she turned their heart towards the, God, the good, and they began to debate about the words of the Savior. Peter said to Mary, and this is important, Sister, we know that the Savior loved you more than all other women. Tell us the words of the Savior that you remember, the things which you know that we don't because you have, we haven't heard them. Mary responded, I will teach you about what is hidden from you. And she began to speak these words to them. Now, a lot of people have derived from that that Mary might have been married to Jesus, um, that there was carnal love, if you want, between them. And I'm not going to touch the subject, but it's really shown in the Gnostic text that Mary was very important, that Jesus would tell her about some concepts and some of, of his, his words. Uh, that he wouldn't uh, say to Peter, who was supposed to be the most important. And then some show some text that there was a jealousy uh, from Peter towards Mary because she was uh, privileged compared to the others. So some legends um, also are 
have completed the persona of uh, Mary. One that is more um, restricted, if you want, is the fact that she went with John <clears throat> and Mary, the mother of Jesus, that they went to Ephesus uh, and uh, lived to the end of uh, their life over there. So I show you on the coast of Turkey, Ephesus, and here is uh, the house of Mary that I showed you in the, pre in the previous talk. Um, the, the little building that is supposed to be the place where Mary ended up her life. Uh, not far from there is the cave of the seven youths of Ephesus, where Mary Magdalene was bur buried after her repose. There is a whole legend of the seven youths of Ephesus that uh, were persecuted by Diocletian and uh, took refuge in that cave. And when uh, the principal administrator around uh, saw that they were hidden there, he literally sealed the, the, um, the cave. And then the emperor died and everything was forgotten. And 300 years later, somebody says, oh, but I can probably use that cave, reopen the cave. And there were the seven you still alive and hungry. And uh, so that was a big miracle. And it's a story that is actually not unique to Ephesus. Some other uh, places in the Middle East have the similar legend. But it is supposed to be also the place where Mary Magdalene was buried uh, near Ephesus. Not the most... Uh, widespread legend is the French legend, where Mary and her companion, companion uh, were sent off to sea. The story goes, and these are beautiful stories, I insist, um, the story goes that um, the Jews were concerned by Mary and Mary Magdalene and um, uh, Lazarus, and so the decided they couldn't kill them uh, while there because they could have been a revolt. And so they put them on the barge without oars, without sails, and hoping that they would just be lost at sea and die without anybody witnessing the thing. So um, in the, the barge was Mary Jacobe, mother of James, and the sister of the Virgin Mary, Mary Salome, mother of the apostles, James and John, Maximin, who was one of the disciples of Jesus, not apostle, but G uh, disciple, Sidonius, the blind man who was healed by Jesus, Marcel, and the martyr's servant, and Sarah, made of the two Marys. And this is important because it is uh, how uh, when the, the boat uh, landed in the Sainte Marie de la Mer, uh, this is what gave the name to the town. And you can see the coat of arms of the Sainte Marie de la Mer that we will locate in a minute, shows the Marys uh, standing in the boat. Here is Giotto. And this is in 1320. This is prior to the Legenda Aurea that is really defining the life of Mary Magdalene for, as far as, as um, iconography. Shows already a barge landing uh, on the soil. It's not indicated that it is France, but you see all the saints there in that barge without oars and without sails. So at this time, before I go on with the legend of Mary, uh, of Mary Magdalene, I'm going to uh, unmute you all. You, I give you, with, I've talked pretty fast, so we have some time. Uh, please uh, have a cup of coffee. Let me unmute you so that you can ask me a question. Oh, you are and supposedly unmuted. This is interesting. Why is that? Okay, so if you have any question, please ask. I don't know why it doesn't do the unmute automatically. I don't know. The mystery of... So please, if you have questions, unmute yourself. 
you are allowed to do that and um, uh, I will try to to work it out supposedly I don't know if you have the the um, uh, chat I don't see it so maybe we haven't done this for for this one so again I'm work it's a work in progress so please uh, let me know if you have questions let me put you all on so I can see So as you can see, it's a very difficult figure because a lot of it is completely artificially put together. But Mary Magdalene came to represent sin by excellence in opposition to Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, who was uh, sinless. And so it, it's, uh, it's quite interesting how the, the, she was manipulated by the church. No questions? Hi, Becky. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me or do you have problems? Uh, well, I'm, I'm unmuted, uh, this is Philip, and I joined a little late, I think. Anyway, uh, it was interesting because so many of the places where you're in, uh, where you've got the images or where the actual paintings are is where I've traveled when I was traveled mm -hmm. across Europe and, and uh, so forth. And, uh, and some I recognized uh, as having seen. Yes. No questions? Um, I have one thing to say. I counted 27 images of Mary Magdalene at uh, Jesus' feet. I still maintain that she was a foot fetishist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. I know that. <laughs> and I've, again, there are so many representations. I just picked some that were slightly different. Oh, and are you seeing uh, us? Yes, I am. And I wondered who uh, Mary, wife of Samuel is. Of a, a Salome, the no, Mary Salome? Uh, no, I, one place that said Mary, wife of Samuel. Yeah, these are all uh, that uh, women that are either the sister of Mary, um, of the Virgin Mary, uh -huh. uh, and the close cousins. They were all, I mean, at some times they are mentioned that way. People have speculated very much who they were because it's always that idea did mary have uh, a sister you know nobody talks about <laughs> you know, uh, these are again you have to look into books uh, about mary there there are some uh, pretty nice books about mary uh, the virgin mary that try to explain these phenomena but it's so much of a construct very <laughs> it's difficult to know who is what Len, Thank can you, you hear me? Aries, yeah. Len, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Phil. So, yeah, uh, the thing that strikes me, I'm looking at this uh, painting from Giotto um, in the 1300s. And so, I'm, and, and I, I wasn't aware of all these legends that you actually were talking about. But what strikes me is the fact that um, and you said you don't want to talk about it. I don't want you know to talk about, for example, Dan Brown's book where he's focusing on Mary Magdalene. So yeah. obviously, there were people who thought about her existence and where she went to somewhere between the time of Christ and the 13th century. But I'm surprised that that the when the book came out, it was like totally startling, like there was no historical. Um, oh, you're going to evidence for it at all. Pardon? Are you going to hear uh, after the, the break that I'm going to go into the legend of Mary Magdalene in France. Oh, and okay. a, a lot of it uh, relies on that uh, by Dan Brown. Don't forget that Dan is playing with you. Because of course, yes. Historical facts or facts that have, are part of history, uh, if they're not historical, if not historical, um, but then sometimes he just puts in some of, you know, a suspense that he likes. So you, it's for you to make the difference between what is 
in quote historical and what is not. Right. I, I was just more concerned with the fact that obviously if Giotto is painting a portrait, painting a, a picture dealing with the voyage, then there must have been a, a considerable amount of literature or something that existed for 1300 years uh, that he is drawing from. And I don't know where he's drawing all that information okay. from. It, it's very interesting because I was looking at the date and it just happens before the Legenda Aurea is mm. uh, written. And uh, it's surprising that already the story was known enough by Giotto that he would paint it that way. That's the earlier representation I have found uh -huh. of uh, Mary and, and his, you know, the, the Mary Magdalene, and the Virgin Mary, etc., and Lazarus uh, are on the barge and they're going to land in, uh, in France. So that was quite puzzling when I saw that. But indeed, there must have been a lot of oral tradition, uh, but probably enough writing that Giotto has access to it. Yeah, very interesting. See, the, I'm now getting going to get into the legend of Mary because that one is very, it's, it's quite interesting, very much followed in France and had tremendous uh, influence on, um, on different developments uh, around the territory. Thank you. You're welcome. Nice seeing you, Dave, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yes, Jeffrey? Hi, I was wondering uh, what kind of relationship the Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene had or they thought that they had. We don't know anything about it, you know, in through the Bible, definitely not. The rest, as I say, is pure speculation. Right. Uh, they appear together at the time of the crucifixion and they, she will appear uh, also close to the tomb. But that's all we know. Okay. That's all we know. There is nothing, you know, the synoptic um, uh, gospels and John uh, don't talk much about it too and it's only Luke, Luke is the one that is the closest to the Virgin but we have nothing that is that shows any relationship they must have you know known one another because they're supposed to have followed Jesus for quite a while mm -hmm. there's a lot of speculation too what was their role because uh, with the time very quickly the church showed that there's domestic role you know, feeding them and, and uh, taking care of their clothes and washing, etc., making women a very nice and domestic figure. Right, right. Now, some people uh, look at that in a different way and say, in fact, they were uh, the real, and they had a, a role. Well, had, it would have made quite a difference if Jesus and Mary Magdalene were married. Yes, and of course, that's so tempting. You right, know? right, right. I'm just saying both sides of the coin, depending on what you, what you think. Yeah, okay. at the, you know, at the end of the talk, you will find I've put, you, uh, I think, four books for you to look at. Uh, there are some really good books, and I'm looking for it. Oh, it's in the kitchen. Uh, but particularly the Susan Haskins book, Mary Magdalene, Myth and Metaphor, is an extraordinary book to read. Very well written, very complete, um, and I really like, and she touches all, all these things. Oh, okay. Good. I would really encourage you to read that. But there are some others that uh, talk particularly about the, the Nag Hammadi uh, codices, uh, about the, the, the Gnostic uh, link, so you, you have tons of books about that, but All I right. give you the four because I know them, I have them, and they are relevant. A long yeah. time ago, I read the Gnostic Gospels by uh, Elaine Pagels. Yes, Pagels. That's a very good book. Uh, she's fantastic. She's yeah, she is. A great, great scholar. Yeah, the, very, very unique in, in her approach to Gnostics. Gnostics. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna start there. And I'm gonna mute you guys. Okay, so let's go back. Let's take this off. 
And uh, let's go on and, and see that wonderful legend, uh, French legend of Mary Magdalene. So they're supposed to arrive there to Marseille. It's actually not really Marseille, but it's at the south, southern part of France in what is called the Camargue. Marseille being a little east of us right now on, on that, that part of, of the, the map. And so they supposedly landed here at what is now called the Sainte Marie de la Mer. So what happens is the, the story, the, the golden legend that is going to be uh, written and which is actually gathering all the oral tradition uh, by uh, Jacob uh, de Voragine in the, the 14th century is going to talk about it, that they tra traverse the Mediterranean, land at the place uh, called Saint Marie de la Mer near Arles. Uh, that also the story that Mary Magdalene will convert the whole of Provence and that said that she will retire to a cave on the hill by Marseille, the Saint Baume which is a beautifully part, beautiful part of Provence, where she gave herself up to a life of penance for 30 years. The story goes that when the time of her death arrived, she was carried by angels to Aix and into the oratory of Maxim, Maximinus and received the viaticum, which is the last rite. Her body was then laid in an oratory constructed by St. Maximinus at Via Lata, that later was called Saint Maxima. So this is a view of nowadays uh, the Sainte Marie de la Mer. As you can see, uh, this is actually the delta of uh, the the Rhine River. So it's very flat. A lot of um, uh, little lakes and and little uh, pond an incredible wildlife because you have lots of migratory, migratory birds uh, that live there, but also we have uh, wild horses and so on. Uh, this particular little town, uh, Sainte Marie de la Mer, uh, as you can see, still has an arena there and then the famous church that we will see uh, in a second here is the fortified church of Sainte Marie de la Mer. The story goes also that during winter uh, 859 to 60 uh, had, was one of the, the hardest uh, winter for that place. The uh, Vikings uh, hibernated in Camargue and uh, around, along uh, with the, the, the story, uh, the, sorry, and uh, according to the story went on uh, to the valley of the Rhone, and it's not the Rhine, sorry, it's the Rhone, until Valence, where they, they were stopped. The church was built in the 12th century and it really shows how it was built to resist any invasion. Actually, I'm going to show you here a painting by Van Gogh that went to that place and shows the, the view of the Sainte Marie. He took a 30 mile stagecoach from Arles at the time where he was living there. In that church, we find some interesting statues. We have Sarah, who was the servant of the two Marys, who has a special follower following with the gypsies. And then you have the altar of Marie Salome and Marie Jacobi with votive gifts. So these are all gifts that have been brought by people that had uh, worshipped them and uh, got, uh, whose wish got uh, exhaust, exhausted. Yeah. No, it's not that. Anyway. Uh, so this really made the Sainte Marie de la Mer uh, a destination for pilgrimage, mostly the Roma. And this is around at the end of May at this, yeah, close to, it's on May 24 is the Feast of San Sarah. You have an enormous amount of the Roma, the gypsies, 
uh, that uh, converge to that place and they literally take over the city uh, for that uh, famous pilgrimage. And you can see here some uh, old pictures showing uh, the ritual bath that was part of the, the that pilgrimage where people would go in the sea and then the benediction of the sea, you see the bishop there in the barge and they would throw some objects in the sea to uh, bless it. So this is a ritual. Now, don't think too much of joining the gypsies when they are in the Sainte Marie. It's not a safe place to go during these pilgrimages. It's enormous crowd and it's better that you belong to the gypsies to go there, not otherwise. As I mentioned, the story uh, goes that uh, when they arrived at the shore, Mary Jacobi, Mary Salome and Sarah remained in Camargue. Martha traveled towards Avignon and ended up in Tarascon. Mary Magdalene, Lazarus, Maxima and Sidonius traveled on to Marseille where Mary Magdalene started to, to preach. They ended up converting the whole of Provence. Lazarus became the first bishop of Marseille. Mary Magdalene went on to Aix where Maxima had already gone. It's about 20 miles north of Marseille. And in keeping with the mission of Jesus um, the, to Mary Magdalene and the apostle, they preached the gospel in Gaul. Maxima became the first bishop of Aix and Mary Magdalene retreated to a mountain cave on the plain of the Plan Dopes called La saint Bob. And this is what you see. This is that whole massif that's still pretty wild <clears throat> where Mary Magdalene retreated to a mountain cave and she remained alone for the last 30 years of her life in the contemplation, prayer and penance. She is said to have been lifted up by the angel seven times each day at the canonical hours and fed heavenly nourishment. And we'll see that representation many times. That's a place in the sand bomb. Here is a detail showing the grotto and inside the grotto, uh, you can see the altar with Mary Magdalene at the foot of the cross and other um, statues representing Mary Magdalene. Every year there is a big uh, procession that happens at the time of her feast day where people uh, start from about 20 miles away and walk all the way to the grotto with lights and chanting and everything. It is also a purpose for a pilgrimage. So people travel regularly there. And the Chapelle Saint-Pilon that is just below it um, is one of the stops. It's almost like the Station of the Cross. So we mentioned the fact that she was a preacher. And here the master of the legend of Mary Magdalene shows her uh, preaching to the crowd. But what is also shown quite regularly is Mary being fed by the angels. Giotto already shows uh, Mary Magdalene speaking to the angel then carried up and being fed. And as you can see, she's only dressed with her hair. Here the, um, the hermit Zosimus is giving her a cloak to be a little more modest I assume. In fact, what happens, why did suddenly Mary Magdalene go into uh, retirement, if we can say, go on, on penance in the wilderness? She has been conflated at that time with uh, Mary of Egypt. Mary of Egypt, um, called also Maria Egyptica, was born somewhere in Egypt and at the age of 12 ran away to the city of Alexandria where she lived an extremely dissolute life. You see, that fits really well. In her vita, it stated that she often refused the money offered for her sexual favors, as she was driven by an insatiable and irrepressible passion, and that she mainly lived by begging, supplemented by spinning, spinning flax. Her vita relates that when she tried to enter the church of the Holy Sepulcher for the celebration, she was barred from doing so by an unseen force. 
realizing that this was because of her impurity, she was struck with remorse. Get that person she was struck she was struck by remorse and um upon seeing an icon of the Theotok the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, uh, outside the church, she prayed her forgiveness and promised to give up the world as she attempted again to enter the church and this time was permitted in. So after uh, venerating the icon, uh, she heard a voice telling her, if you cross the Jordan, you will find glorious rest. She went to the monastery of St. John the Baptist on the bank of the river Jordan where she received absolution and after that the Holy Communion. And the story goes that she's going to go into the wilderness, just uh, leaves with three loaves of bread. Um, and after that is going to be fed by the angels, just as the story of Mary Magdalene becomes. And so it is in fact, these two figures are again conflated uh, with Mary Magdalene. She also uh, had uh, knew the, the saint and Saint Zosimas, who we just saw in the previous image by Giotto. Uh, and she's given some closing and she tells him to come back, to give her the communion and then come back the next year. And when he comes back the next year, he finds her dead and something tells him that she died the day after he gave her the communion. So this, comes back is really uh, becomes the story of Mary Magdalene too. And we see this uh, anonymous uh, painting in, in Warsaw National Museum of uh, Mary dressed just with her hair elevated by the angels to be fed. And these two uh, sculptures, uh, this one in Torun, uh, Poland, showing this. And this is the center part of the, the great uh, altarpiece by Riemann Schneider that is now in the Bayerisches National Museum in Munich. Um, so this has been detached from that uh, center part of the altarpiece. She is uh, life-size, by the way. And it's an extraordinary sculpture even in small uh, manuscript we find Tadeo Crivelli with the St. Mary Magdalene penitent uh, you know raised to to the heavens by just lovely little cherubs that just shown by by fa little faces later we have more expanded views of uh, Mary Magdalene taken up to heaven. So this is not, again, the idea that she's um, taken to heaven for the afterlife. This is the moment where she's going to be fed. Though we see signs of penance, as you can see here, the, the whip, as well as the, uh, the tunic that I forgot the name of it, but it's made of very hard fiber that really, that are signs of penance. The Spanish painter. She became a very, very important figure in the iconography in, in Spain too. Of course, among the penitent, and this is that part where she's supposedly in the wilderness, one of the most striking is the Donatello in Mary Magdalene that used to be in the baptistry and is now in the Museo, Museo dell'Opera del Duomo. Extraordinary work uh, made of polychrome wood. It used to have to be uh, colored, uh, but this is a late work by Donatello uh, after he worked in Padua and is extraordinary. Here you can see the, the profile and then was followed by some of his uh, students, Desiderio da, da Settignano, that does a pretty similar work. In Germany, um, Gregor Erhard shows Mary Magdalene, a little more voluptuous uh, Mary Magdalene.
painted uh, as a penitent, as you can see, even by uh, Sandro Botticelli. Here she's um, shown covered by the hair, the last moment. So she's going to get uh, the last right. And we can see another part of her life where the angels are just uh, carrying her. You can notice too that how the painting has faded. So you have the feeling she's a ghost because you see the steps behind her, but in fact, it's just the painting that has uh, faded. She is going to become one of the most represented uh, figure again, uh, the penitent, one of the many, many representation by El Greco of uh, Mary Magdalene in penitence. You have what, um, identifies her is that um, jar with ointment. The beautiful Titian, also one of the many by Titian, where you see her as penitent with the skull, which is that always that idea of vanitas, the fact that life uh, is only transitory and you have the oil of uh, ointment. Agostino, Agostino Cahachi, in the early 17th century. And you see the whip also that is together with the, goes together with the penance. The penitent in the landscape, beautiful landscape too. Artemisia Gentileschi, showing it very barely seeing the jar with the ointment but also identifying her as a previous sinner because she has a, the address is much too low cut for anybody that saintly. Guido Reni. And this is also a fact is that that was one of the only times where the painters could um, show a woman and show a little more flesh than they would normally do for a saint because she was, she was, she had a dissolute life prior to her conversion. It allows them to show that. And we have to remain human in looking at that iconography is that uh, a lot of patrons were looking for things that were a little more pleasant to look at. And the uh, Canova, the penitent Madeleine also, uh, this is one of the, the more recent representation of her uh, more neoclassical view. It was considered the greatest of uh, modern time, Canova by a standout. Now, another story that is attached to Mary Magdalene is something that has to do with the Futa Sacra. Uh, I've talked at length about the uh, pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela, and here is Vesle. Uh, where you can see here that was one of the road to that would convene in uh, Rances Valles uh, in the Pyrenees before going on to Santiago de Compostela. So uh, Vesle ha had quite a, a story related to Mary Magdalene and particularly to that, um, trying to find more or less the, the place uh, here, so about here is Saint Maxima. It's the the place where Mary Magdalene is supposedly have uh, was interred. Uh, so there is a place down here, Saint Maxima, and remember on the map and Vesle. So Saint Maxima has a particular uh, reveration for Mary Magdalene, actually. Uh, the embalmed body was supposedly placed in uh, a chapel that was later on built on as a, as a large uh, Gothic church to honor and protect it. Uh, the body was supposed to have been removed and hidden uh, during the Saracens um, invasion and uh, was in a sense uh, lost uh, in mind. In 1279, St. Louis' nephew uh, heard that the relics were buried in the town of Saint Maxima uh, and ordered the excavation to search for it. And supposedly, they found a marble tomb. 
when they try to open it, a wonderful smell of perfume filled the air. And um, inside uh, laid her entire body except her jawbone. So here's actually the reliquary of uh, Mary Magdalene, and you can see a skull with a jawbone in Saint Maximin. This is the interior of the story. So um, the in the dust inside the tomb was a wooden tablet wrapped in wax and was written on, here lies the body of Mary Magdalene. And the parchment had explained that her remains had been secretly transferred during the night uh, in 710 and hidden so that the Saracen wouldn't find it. So on April, 1290, uh, April 6, 1295, the skull was reunited with the jawbone at St. John Lateran in Rome, where it had been venerated for centuries. And then it was uh, sent back to, uh, to Saint Maximin. This caused tremendous um, pilgrimage to, to Saint Maximin at the time. Royalties came and so on. But before that 1297 story uh, is another very important story. About 1050, the monks of Vesle began, uh, started to claim to hold the relics of Mary Magdalene. So we have two places uh, brought, as they said, uh, from the Holy Land uh, in the ninth century by St. Badio. A little later, uh, the monk of Vesle declared that he had detected in a crypt in Saint Maximin in Provence. Uh, an empty sarcophagus with the remain that uh, a, a representation of an unction at Bethany where Jesus' head was anointed by Mary of uh, Bethany. So uh, that, uh, at that time they declared that it was the tomb of Mary Magdalene and that the fact that in fact the remains of Mary Magdalene had been uh, taken to Vesle earlier that story is very difficult to put together, but as always, there was a dream and a monk dreamt so very early on that the remains of Mary Magdalene had, talked, had appeared to him in a dream and that the saint wanted to move from Saint-Maximin to Vesle. So uh, he went to his superior and talked to him about that uh, dream and the superior told him uh, that this was great and they were going to try to, to respond to the wishes of Mary Magdalene. So they sent a monk to Saint Maxima to pretend that he uh, was going to be part of that community until he was entrusted uh, probably 10 years later uh, with the care of the, re the remains of Mary Magdalene in Saint Maxima. Once he did, he just took the remains under his arms and decided to come back to Vesle. And all the way uh, getting close to Vesle, the population in the villages who had heard what was happening were uh, rejoicing and, and uh, celebrating the arrival of the relics of Mary Magdalene. And for about two centuries, uh, the, uh, the, the church, the Abbey Church, that was named at that time Saint Marie Madeleine, uh, pretended to hold the, the relics of Mary Magdalene, which enhanced their position as far as a pilgrimage center. So uh, that worked until finally, as I said, the, the, the nephew of the king, uh, Louis, went to Saint Maximin and said, no, 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 they are there. And so they lost all their um, credibility and literally the, the pilgrimage went down the drain and they, they lost all uh, the trust of the believers. This is a view of the inner side of the Abbey Church of uh, Vesle. So you can see how the stories are so complicated, uh, but it also shows the importance of uh, Mary Magdalene that she could attract so many people by just thinking that her remains uh, were belong to, to the Abbey Church. So Mary Magdalene is also going to, see, to be seen many times as the patron saint. 
And so uh, in doing so, we have to look into the wings of many of these beautiful works of art. This is the famous uh, Portinari uh, altarpiece that is in the Uffizi in Florence. And it's the side wing here shows uh, St. Margaret uh, with a, a foot on the, the dragon. And then Mary Magdalene, who was the patron saint of uh, Margaret of um, uh, Margaret Portinari. She has two names. It's going to be Margaret Mary Madeleine. Um, is going to to have uh, has the the um, jar with ointment and is there as a protector of the woman. Here again, uh, Mary Magdalene, probably the wing of an altarpiece. The delightful Saint Mary Magdalene by Quentin Matze, Matze, or Matze, depending on how you want to spell it. Ambrosius Benson, very delicate Mary Magdalene. Piero di Cosimo, Saint Mary Magdalene. The famous Caravaggio, Mary Madeline. Again, it's one of the Mary Magdalene that uh, Caravaggio painted. A different representation by Jan van Kessel. As it became a tradition uh, in the second part of the 17th century, they had these cartouches in the center with saints or Mary or Christ, and then a garland of flowers surrounding. <coughs> surrounding her. The Georges de Latour, French painter, <coughs> Magdalene of Nightlight, he was a specialist of these candlelight views. It's really beautiful. It shows the, the effect of that flickering light. I'm sorry, I'm losing my voice. Then the delightful sculpture, uh, my, my very favorite at the Cluny Museum in Paris, <coughs> now named the Museum of Middle Ages. This is a um, sculpture by Jan Borman, who is a, a Brussels uh, sculptor. And then two sculptures, uh, one by Algardi, who is a stucco sculpture, but the beautiful Bernini, Mary Magdalene in marble and so typical Bernini with all the, the tension of the movements. So you can see the diversity of the representation of Mary Magdalene in, in many different roles, many that actually don't belong to her life, but she has been made to be a penitent and to be an adulteress and, and so on and so on. So it's a very complex uh, persona. The, the stigma that it brought to people is in, incredible. And all the way to the 19th century uh, in, in that epilogue is that uh, it, she gave her name to some asylums that were called the Magdalene Laundries that were institution from the 18th century to the late 20th century for an uh, institution that housed fallen women, term that used to imply female uh, sexual uh, promiscuity and work, or worked in prostitution. These asylums operated throughout Europe and North America for much of the 19th and well into the 20th century the last one closed in 1996. And these institutions were named after Mary Magdalene. In Ireland, an estimated 30,000 women were confined in these asylum. And this is really where the scandal uh, came out because the condition in which these uh, women were living were atrocious. Uh, the life was unimportant. They found uh, entire a series of uh, bodies and uh, buried next to this institution without any respect. Sorry, I missed that. Could you say <laughs> it again, please? 
So um, in the early years, the Philadelphia Ma Magdalene uh, functioned as a refuge for prostitutes. So in okay. 18... I found this on the web for function as a refuge for prostitute. Check it out. <laughs> my, it's sorry, but my uh, yeah, iPad is, is talking to me. So I'm going to get the sound off. Uh, so uh, that was in 1877, uh, and it went on uh, working for uh, a long time. In New York, Magdalene Society was established in 1830 with the purpose of rescuing women, which was a good... Uh, purpose in the sense, but then the treatment was absolutely horrible. In Australia, from the early 1890s to the 1960s, uh, most Australian state capitals had a large Roman Catholic convent that contained a commercial laundry that was uh, manned by young women who um, who had uh, led a life that wasn't uh, correct according to society. So this was finally uh, suppressed, but not before a lot of them uh, lost their life or really were, who led a terrible life. So anyway, this is the conclusion. So to tell you how uh, the, the whole idea that uh, the whole persona that Mary Magdalene projected had such an influence on the society around us and so many times women were considered as sinners to start with. Uh, and I've been thinking about it quite often, that it's always the women that are getting the, the, the biggest um, problems of their, their, who they are because to protect men, because men seem not to be able to protect themselves. But really, uh, we need to take care of women so that they don't have to make an effort. And this is uh, relevant not only for Christianity but in Islam and so on. So, on these good words, um, I'm going to unmute you if you want. No, you can unmute yourself for whatever reason. I cannot unmute you. I used to be able to do that, but he doesn't want to do it. So, please unmute yourself and let me know what you think about this. The next talk, let me show you the next talk, if I can know. Uh, first of all, the, the, here are the four books that I would tell you. This is the Susan Haskins fabulous book. You have the Gospel of Mary Magdalene by Karen King. It's an important book too, it's a small one. You have here Kana Ritchie that talks about Mary Magdalene and many others, women who follow Jesus. So that could be of interest to, uh, to one of you there. And then you have The Meaning of Mary Magdalene, another book of the importance of Mary Magdalene. Quickly before we go from Istanbul to Athens, that's next week, and that's going to be lighter in message, uh, but it's uh, uh, literally a voyage, a cruise from uh, Istanbul, then along the coast of Turkey, the uh, some islands, and then uh, arrival to Athens. So please let me 